Welcome to Generation Hope, a podcast by Connect.Faith. This season, we're talking to young adults who are pursuing careers that don't always have linear paths to entry. We'll be talking to musicians, visual artists, and others about the unique challenges and rewards young creatives can face as they turn their passions into a career. So today I'm talking to Ella Ritz, who is a program content coordinator for Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks so much for having me on Generation Hope. This is a real treat. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad that we could have you on today. So why don't we just start with you telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, of course. I was uh, born and raised in Los Angeles County in a small town called La Cunada, Flint Ridge. My parents are intensely creative people. My mom was on stage and set, and I was a vocal instructor. And my late father was an actor, puppeteer, producer, and writer. <laughs> so definitely come from a creative household. I was one of the super goofy creative kids, kind of an oddball. I loved acting in the children's theater in my town. My homework was always covered in doodle. My imagination and my dreams were always equally wacky. I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Maryland, and it was there that I studied painting, got my BFA in painting, and a few interesting twists and turns in my career. And then we've ended up at the observatory. <laughs> I'm so excited to delve into that. <laughs> awesome. So it, it seems like art and creativity was part of your <laughs> genetic makeup, if you will. <laughs> it came from the, the very beginning. Was there a point where you decided, yes, this is what I want to spend my life doing, or this is how I, I want to make money is actually through this art? Like when did art become less of a a hobby and more of a, I want to major in this in college and and do more in it? Great question. It became a serious interest, I'd say in like early high school when I like, when I knew I wanted to study it, but really my interest in art started when I was four years old, like even three or so, like when someone would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, like I would say an artist and that stayed the same, Mm. like and uh, you know until I was like 22 or so yeah when my mom or dad would (laughs) drop me off at preschool I would usually like cry about my parent leaving me (laughs) but then then every time I would realize wait there's an easel in the classroom with paints over there Mm. and I'd run to the easel and make a very carefully crafted masterpiece and then I'd forget why I was sad so (laughs) Mm. (laughs) from the very beginning it was always about art and I knew that you know even if I wasn't going to become like a freelance professional painter per se I knew that creativity would be a part of my um, work situation somehow. I love that what so it seems like art was almost a calming presence for you at the beginning and definitely a distraction from whatever (laughs) the sad part was of leaving your parents in preschool. Do you still find art to be that calming presence for you or what is it about art that keeps you impassioned with it? It was always a comfort for me. Like in the toughest moments of my life, art was always there. It was a way for me to express like, you know, anger, sadness, frustration, angst, confusion, and, you know, all like, and be able to self-soothe. That was like the one tool that I had. And very recently, I've come to terms with the fact that I, I'm a very highly sensitive person. Like it takes more time and energy for me to process the world. So this like quiet time for creativity has always been like how I ground myself. And it was really important in my formative years. I love that you said it's essentially a way for you to express emotions in a really healthy way. Mm-hmm. Precisely. That's beautiful. So you. you love art. It sounds like you, as much as you put into it, it gives back to you. So take us through you graduate college and then now you're working at Griffith Observatory. Take us through that journey. 
Yes. So um, my career took very, very interesting twists and turns. If you had told me when I was a senior in high school that someday I was going to be working at Griffith Observatory, like I, I would have fallen backwards in a stupor. <laughs> I would have been so very confused. But yeah, in, in college, it, it was, it, it, Micah is, is an art school. So you know, I was very much immersed in the art world and I was loving it so much. And I, I thought in college that like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a freelance artist, like work in a studio, live kind of like a solitary work existence, e exhibit in galleries, maybe like co-curate exhibitions. Like that's what I was really passionate about. But then I got a job in college as um, an education assistant at the Walters Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And I was working with kids and families as well. And for a lot of the time, I would give tours to families and the kids like as part of their summer camp and also like leading studio classes there. And I realized I really loved education. When I would see someone's eyes light up because they learned something new, that, that was all of it for me. And having like a whole a gaggle of coworkers, having that sense of community was like felt really special. And I realized like, I don't know if I can be isolated in the studio by myself. <laughs> like, I think I drive myself absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah. I exhibited in some galleries here and there. I made a few more pieces. But I realized like, man, I really miss working in a museum. Mm. And so when I got, I went back home to Los Angeles after being in Baltimore for four years. And I had this document of every single museum within like a 30 mile radius oh of where I lived. And I would check their job pages every single day until uh -huh. I found a listing for something I was qualified for or would or would find cool. Griffith Observatory was listing a job for a museum guide. And I was like, I don't know too much about astronomy. I go to telescope conventions every year with my brothers, but like, just believe me, I hardly know anything. It was mostly because <laughs> they were into it. It was like my one time to see brother Dan who lives in Boston. So it was like mm -hmm. a fun thing that we do, but I really did not know much apart from like, you know, an elementary school foundation. Sure. So I applied, I got an interview, and I thought I completely bombed it. But for some reason, they were like, you're going to make a good tour guide. I was like, okay, I'll study really hard, I promise. <laughs> oh, I, had this, I had this notebook that I filled with everything that I was learning um, on the job, like about, you know, the pendulum and the Tesla coil. Like, I had no idea. And so I, like... Outside of work, I mean, I don't recommend this. Like, I didn't get paid for this. I did so much research and, like, created these, like, touring documents for all the guides to use. And it, it, it was just, like, it was... It was a way for me to feel like I knew what I was talking about because I had the research right there. And if I ever sure. felt like, you know, like I'm going to blank, I'm going to forget something like I had it. I could be like, give me one second. Look at my book. <laughs> and that was an incredible job for a year. It was so fulfilling. We have, we had an on-site school program and teaching fifth graders about astronomy and, you know, seeing their eyes light up, of course, about space. Like, you know, it wasn't art, but it was that same feeling that I really craved in a workplace. But then the pandemic hit. I was furloughed from that job and also my two other jobs. I worked at a children's museum, Southern California Children's Museum at the same time. And I had just left a job at a high school working as like a club instructor. So suddenly I had zero employment. And for six months, I continued to have no employment. And after a certain amount of time, I, I sent out a desperate plea to my boss, like, is there anything I can do at the observatory? Like, I know that we're not hiring anything special right now. Like there was a hiring freeze. Are there any like projects I could do? I told him my skills and he said, actually, since we can't have the on-site school program anymore, we want to transition to an online school program. It seems like you have experience teaching kids and you're creative and this seems like a good fit. I was like, oh my God, that sounds like a dream come true. And here we are about two years later, we have a fully operational online school program. And I have been the person um, leading the creative direction of the entire mm -hmm. program. So I'm called the, the program content coordinator. So I help with scripts. I source imagery or I tell other people like our photographers and such like what they need to capture I string it all together I edit videos I make animations 
there's like these extensive program packets that we have where like teachers and students can do fun activities from home and in the classroom. And I've, I've learned so much about graphic design, about video editing. And it's just, it's an endlessly fulfilling job. And every week we serve about 6,000 local fifth graders. Oh my goodness. So I think like by the end of this school year, I think we're, we will have served about 100,000 fifth graders, which wow. is far beyond what we were able to serve in person. Of course, you know, nothing beats going up to the physical observatory, but I mean, you know, it just being able to impact those kiddos for a little while is, you know, priceless. First of all, I want to say, just commend you for the level of commitment that you put into researching all of that stuff and just trying to be the best at whatever job was given to you, the best that you could be. I think, to, let, let me know if you've ever gotten this impression. I think sometimes people get the impression that folks who go to art school or try to become a freelancer are seen as, you know, not hardworking or yeah. taking an easier way out. And this just shows me how entirely wrong they are. Have you ever gotten that that kind of stereotype given to you? Oh, certainly by, by other people. I mean, I was very, very lucky to have a supportive family who, you know, was fine to send me to a private art school. That's an immense privilege. I, I mean, I still can't believe that happened, that I was able to do that and that, you know, I was taken seriously in life and in, in what I wanted to do. But yeah, I mean, all, all throughout high school, I've I experienced all kind of condescending comments about that. You know, how could you ever turn that into a living? But when I was researching colleges, one thing that stood out about Micah was just how specific the classes looked. Like, mm. you know, e even some things that didn't necessarily look useful, they were so they were so niche. So I remember this one class was called the Black Death in Literature and History. I was like, that's so specific. But you know, they had business classes, study abroad programs, all about professional development as an artist. They have, of course, like graphic design program, animation programs, and you know, you can do kind of like a cross disciplinary approach there. It's perfectly possible. And I, one of my mentors was Amy Sherald, who painted the former first lady, Michelle Obama, like they're, they're like wonderful, inspiring people who work there and uh, are involved with that community. So it, it, it presented me with so many fantastic opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I have no regrets when it comes to art school. I worked my arse off. <laughs> Pardon my half French. <laughs> yeah, it, it's because it, it's all project based. Like you'll have yeah. a six hour studio course and then you'll have to come home and, you know, make a an art piece, which it's it's a different process, of course, than writing an essay. But there's like there's a lot of work and heart that goes into art because it usually is very much reflective of people's like inner minds and personalities like People care about their art and it, it takes a lot, takes a lot of energy. And, you know, if you're truly serious about it, like art play, uh, art school is a wonderful choice, I'd say. And it, it shows in, in the way that you're talking about the research that you did when becoming a tour guide and how you're working at two other jobs at the same time. Clearly, you know, the level of dedication and ability to be flexible and hardworking so that you can follow what makes you happy in a job is mm -hmm. very inspiring. Let's talk more about you being a program content coordinator. It When you were explaining it, I was like, oh my goodness, it seems like an artist's dream come true because you're saying, you know, first of all, your job is creativity. It seems like <laughs> it is just mm -hmm. filled with creativity. You're saying you get to do video editing, graphic design, animation, and then on top of it, you're still finding that small little niche of you love not just art, but how learning can impact kids' lives and then finding a way to bring your creative passions into that. When you reflect on where you are now versus maybe where you thought you would be when you entered MICA, 
how would you characterize kind of the journey to get there? Would, cause it, it all sounds amazing, like where you ended up, right? But you did have the six months of, of being furloughed and you were working three jobs and you were <laughs> put yeah. into a position you'd never been in before. What was that like for your, your mental health and, mm. and kind of playing into self-confidence and, and just what was that journey? Not just what that journey was, but what was it mm. like? I, guess. I love that question. Yeah. So right out of college, um, I very much wanted to do exactly what I set out to do, which was to be a freelance painter and perhaps like part curator and have something, something having to do with museums, perhaps. And I, I remember at one point, this was the summer after my last semester at college, um, I was selected to be a part of two gallery shows at this that were occurring at the same time and they wanted the exact same painting and I was like I am not in the position to refuse either opportunity so over the course of two weeks I built a second I made a second painting oh like built it from scratch again like with the canvas and everything this this was originally a piece that took two months but I I created that second piece in two weeks Worked like 80 hour weeks with my other jobs as well. But yeah, I was able to exhibit in both places and like that, that was fun and all, but the process of getting my artwork to both galleries and spending so much money on the U-Haul, the transportation, the publicity, having a website, it just kind of bummed me out how many barriers there are Mm. to like be a fine artist. And, you know, of course I've done a quite a privileged individual, I'll say. I've always had familial support when it comes to my art practice, but it bummed me out how people without that privilege, like this, op- these opportunities like won't be possible in the first place. Like there's fees to apply to every gallery about, uh, unless it's like a nonprofit kind of thing. Most galleries, there's like a $35 fee that you pay to apply. Mm. And so if you want to apply to a ton of galleries, it like those costs, they rack up and you have to pay for the own, your own transportation to get all your work there. And if your work doesn't sell, then you've just spent so much money. And like, it, it was, it was, it was a lot to think about. And of, of course, I, I love the art world. I love museums, you know, galleries are t- riveting and awesome and amazing. And I love the work that people do to inspire others, but it just, it, it, it felt overwhelming in that sense. Yeah, it bummed me out too much. And, and also, of course, I, I realized I enjoyed working with others after the Walters Art Museum, um, working there in college. So yeah, I was, I was looking for something different. And yeah, applying to all the museums and getting that job at, at the Griffith Observatory and also at the Children's Museum, those were two very formative jobs, I'd say. What about the job that you are doing now? You mentioned some of the really cool things that that you get to do. How do you see creativity as being, or I guess, do you see creativity as being a central piece of, of this job? Oh, certainly. And it's something that I'm endlessly grateful for. Um, it, it, there's so I used to have a very intense like personal practice with art. Like I, I have a very particular style. I have, I had like quite a vision for the artwork that I wanted to produce, but I've noticed for the past two years, I haven't felt the desire or the need to really create much outside of work. And I mm. thought that meant that, you know, I was like a, a bad artist or something, or like I wasn't who I used to be and I'm not as creative, but I realized it's because I feel creatively fulfilled by my workplace. Mm. And once I had that realization, I was like, I'm not, no, I am still an artist. I am very much an artist. I am doing, I'm creating. And that is enough. I don't Mm. have to have a particular practice or like, you know, a really independent study in order to be an artist. And yeah, it took some reframing of mine to realize that because, you know, originally I, I didn't want to work for anyone else when it came to my art. Like I wanted to have my own vision. My, my mom would say like, you should really get into like, you know, illustrating, maybe take a class or something in that or graphic design. And I, I'd resist it because I was like, no, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to draw what somebody else wants me to. But that's honestly one of my greatest regrets is like Mm. in college, not, not, um, exploring different skills 
that, you know, mm-hmm. that, that I could absorb because it, it would have given me more flexibility now. I mean, of course, of course, now I've, I've had to train on those things individually. I've gotten much better at graphic design and video editing, but yeah, it's my work is, is so creative. And the fact that it's making a difference and I can see that difference, it, it's, it's enough for me. So you said earlier that it used to kind of be your goal to work more solitary and go Mm -hmm. be a freelance artist. And that has evolved. Do you have an idea of what, of how you might continue to evolve? Like has this newfound uh, passion for educating kids and, and using artists, using art to do so, is this kind of, I guess I'm asking, is this your new thing or what are you imagining your future could hold and how might art play into that? Hmm. I've been thinking a lot about this recently. I think my career could go in one of like two directions, which is like perhaps art directorship of a museum or Mm. something on the more educational programming side. So for instance, at the observatory, like we have planetarium shows and you know, art an art director at the observatory would have a heavy hand in what goes into that planetarium show, and like the the branding that the observatory puts forth, and like the the the, the voice that we want to show visually for everyone. So like that's what an art director would do. But an educational programmer, that's you know, bringing programs to all of the all of the audiences that we serve and educating about science and what the observatory is and all about the the sky and such. And both avenues are really interesting. And I think right now I'm in a really nice sweet spot because I feel like I'm doing sort of both coordinating the the visual brand for this school program. And also I, I didn't I didn't have a chance to uh, mention this, but I, I also work at Griffith Observatory Foundation, which is the, the nonprofit donor support of the mm. of, of the observatory. And for them, I do graphic design. I put out the newsletters. I help with events, our volunteers, and I do like odd creative projects here and there. Because you're both, you kind of have a foot in education and you have a foot in arts. Have you seen like Obviously, across the country, there's an issue with schools being poorly funded, and the first thing to hit to get cut typically are art programs. I don't know if you've seen any of that happening around you or seen the effects yeah. of it, but how can you imagine that having an effect on either the kids you serve or mm-hmm. just the future of being able to be creative and and how art might play a role in, in mm. our world. Yeah, I think I think it's intensely detrimental that art programs are are the first to be cut or cut at all. It's it's an outlet for people. It is a way to express emotion. And kids, if if they're not given that, if they're not given the tools to express themselves, like there, you know, there's a lot of thoughts that kids won't express and don't express. And you know, adults are the same way, but having that way to express yourself without having to, you know, air it to the world in like a really concrete way. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a language in and of itself. Mm. And I think if, if you rob kids the opportunity to learn about art making and, and have the time to create that, it's not going to be good. It's really sad because I think some of the thought behind let's defund art programs are let's give kids the tools that they need to go out and make money and that's it Mm -hmm. right but there are art programs give a different kind of tools right art gives people the tools to be able to express themselves maybe express emotions in a way that they weren't comfortable doing in any other outlet yeah and 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 even if like people aren't comfortable with the idea of like children having creative outlets, art has like more to offer than that as well. Like art history teaches us so much about the human mind throughout, mm. th- th- you know, since the beginning of humans at all, like cave from back to cave paintings, art making ha- and making our mark physically on something in the world is, is an innate human desire. 
Like we want to create our mark. We want to be remembered. We need to express ourselves. And, and if you look at just how the trajectory of like art, culture, just like m- happens <laughs> in, in different cultures throughout history, it's, it's just, it's really, it's really interesting. And you can always learn more about yourself and about history just by looking at art and learning about it. I think that's really important. That was was a really good point of there, there are so many different lenses through which we Mm -hmm. can view the world and art is just a really beautiful one. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a way for people to understand others and understand themselves just a little bit better. So you, you said you were very privileged in the fact that you had a lot of familial support in going for an art degree. Um, and you're, you're from around LA. So you kind of knew the LA scene a little bit. What would you tell somebody who maybe is thinking about either going to art school or quitting their job to do something that fulfills them in a creative sense? that they haven't had the opportunity to do before, but maybe they're nervous because they've heard these stereotypes of you'll never make any money if you're an artist and you'll always be eating, you know, instant noodles and (laughs) you'll have to work multiple jobs to be able to make it. What would you tell someone who is, who is struggling with the decision of kind of how to figure out where their love for creativity and art could fit into just living in this world. I think, you know, just in this, in the simplest way, just block out those other voices. If Mm. there's something that makes you happy, whether it's art or something else, like be, be earnest about that. Be honest with yourself about what truly makes you happy. Cause that's what life is all about is seeking things that make you happy. And if you help like your loved ones around you, like, you know, your, your parents understand like, this is not some hobby. This is something I'm really passionate about. And then showing them all the different important applications that art has within your culture. I think that'll really help them understand. Like if you look around you, everything around you has been carefully designed. Like the shelves next to you, someone someone built those. The, the pictures on your wall, someone photographed that or someone painted that or, it's, you know, someone at a print shop printed it like that. That's that's an artistic thing to do as well. Like the things you do on the weekends, the concerts you go to, the museums you go to, like uh, the advertisements that you see posted absolutely everywhere, the logos that you see um, on businesses. An artist has created and coordinated all of those things. It is everywhere. We need those visual cues. We need visual markers. There's a place for that. There's value in that. If that is earnestly what you want to do, if you're doing what you're passionate about, people will notice. Is there anything that we didn't get to talk about that you really wanted to? Oh, yes. I, I would like to mention um, <laughs> there was this one point, I think, I think I was in my second year of college and I came home to Los Angeles for the summer. And my mom and I were thinking about like different jobs or temporary internships I could have over the summer. And she found this call for an intern um, at this place called Curatorial Assistance Traveling Exhibitions. They needed a photography a restoration and documenter. Like there was this, there was this man named Emil Otto Hoppe, whose photography, uh, was was kind of lost to time. He was, when was it? I think like 1920s through 1940s, I believe. I might be wrong on that. But he took these incredible photographs and his work just was archived and people had not seen it. And so this company came in and was working on restoring them and getting them out into the world. But anyway, they were offering an internship helping with that. And I was like, oh, but that doesn't sound like very artistic. Like I want to do painting. I want to like work in a museum. Like that doesn't sound fun. But I applied, I got in and it was like, that was such a valuable experience. And I realized it was because it it gave me some new tools to work with. I learned Photoshop. I learned photography restoration. I learned how to be careful with, you know, like historic objects Mm -hmm. and like editing, going into metadata, all that stuff. And I still use those skills to this day. And so I think, you know, if there's any advice I could give anyone who's just starting out trying to find employment and something that they're passionate about, like, don't be afraid to try something that's kind of a stretch. Like that was a stretch mm. for me, I thought. And those skills, like I said, turned out to be vastly helpful. 
And I think like one of my like guiding principles is just to try everything because every experience you have will feed into each other. They'll build off of each other and kind of like the more diverse worldview that you have, the more powerful your, your work will be. I think that that goes beyond the world of art too. Just continuing to educate yourself, no matter what your field is, is so important because then you'll be able to understand so many different perspectives. I also like just the whole message of that story is just to go for it. Like there are so many jobs out there that have all these requirements for you to even apply. Just Mm -hmm. go for it and see what happens. So this podcast is called Generation Hope. And Mm -hmm. I ask everybody who comes on the same two questions. And I asked you to be on this podcast for a few reasons, but one of them was that I think your story of how you took a degree in painting and you might not have ended up in a job that specifically does painting, but you've been able to integrate art and creativity into everything that you're doing and be creatively fulfilled. And I think that's a really inspiring story that will give a lot of people hope. So I was wondering what If this story gives some other people hope, what right now is giving you hope? Oh, I love that. Well, what comes to mind, I guess, pretty immediately is curiosity, Mm. witnessing it around me in its many forms. I think not only is it a survival trait that we use to understand the things that perplex us and perhaps endanger us, I see it as something that will guarantee our longevity as a species <laughs> and it, like if we continue to fuel it you know yeah. I think I think curiosity is a huge driver for empathy as well and a huge driver of course for seeking knowledge empathy gives us love for ourselves and for others and knowledge gives us the power and agency to protect ourselves and others so curiosity fuels it all so stay curious, do things that you love. I love that. Uh, Given all of what we've talked about today, what do you hope for? And that can be for humanity. It can be just for yourself and your career. It can be on whatever scale you want. What do you hope for? Well, I hope that people will continue to be curious uh, and stay persistent in in what they desire for themselves. There's always so much to learn about oneself and others and about the world. Explore the path less traveled, listen to others. And I, I hope that people more specifically keep looking up into the sky. They're, like it's, I think astronomy, the field, it, it's, it's a lot like art in some ways. Like astro- we are all bound together by our cosmic place, which, you know, which is earth itself. Earth is a planet in space. We are in space too. Space is something that we all own and we all share with Mm -hmm. each other. So, and art I think is, is similar. Like we all have that desire to make our mark on the world and creativity plays out in so many different ways and I think if, if we realize that art bounds us together and our place in space, that fact bounds us together, I think that that leaves a lot of room for people to see common ground with each other. You know, we share so many similar traits. And I just hope that people will recognize that it, it is worth it to explore the unknown, things that are perplexing, because it'll, in the end, bind us all together beautiful well thank you so much for for being here and sharing your story with us of course it was such a pleasure to be here (laughs) well this has been generation hope a podcast by connect.me thanks for listening